Good morning, everybody. Hello, welcome. Hello, yay. <laughs> oh, it's so wonderful to have you all here. Thank you so much for being here. Can you believe 31 years? 31. Can you believe it? I'm Julia Cannon, and I'm with Ozark Mountain Publishing, the producers of the Ozark UFO Conference. And like I said, it's the 31st year, and none of this would be available and here without you, our wonderful speakers, our fantastic vendors, people like Race Hobbs with KGRA Radio. <laughs> I'm telling you, he's, he's the one that gets us in touch with these wonderful speakers. Okay? He's the one that makes that happen. Okay? So, like before, please go out there and give him a big hug and a big thank you, man. Okay? <laughs> Acknowledge him. All right? And thank you so much. And definitely get down to those vendors because, like I said, it's all of this that makes this happen. All right? It's you. It's the speakers. It's the vendors. It's... Race, it's a whole team. And we got these guys back here, Ted and his AV crew. They're gonna make all this magic happen, all right? So, yes. We have a super, super team that, because, yeah, it's not one person that makes this happen. It's a whole operation, a whole team. And I'm so proud to be part of it. So thank you, thank you, 31 years to be bringing this, and let's just keep it going, right? Yeah. <laughs> all right, I'm not going to take up all the time because we got the man who will bring on and keep going. You love him, you demand him, the best, the most wonderful master of ceremonies, Forrest Crawford. <laughs> Thank you for embarrassing me. Thank you. Oh my, here we are again. 31 years. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is my favorite thing to do all year long, honest to God, uh, has come to this conference. And I feel very honored, very honored to be asked back to be um, the MC after, uh, uh, year after year. Um, I, I feel very honored to introduce to you the fantastic presenters that we have at this conference. And um, I, I try and have a little bit of fun do it. So... Um, I'm glad to be back. All right. I, uh, I cannot think of a better way to kick off this conference than our, our first presenter. Uh, he's been uh, researching UFOs for about 20 years. Um, he believes that it constitutes the greatest mystery of our time. I don't think that he would get any argument from us in this room. Uh, he is author of several volumes of history and a speculative book about the future. His latest work entitled UFOs for the 21st Century uh, I'm sorry, UFOs for the 21st Century Mind um, is a, re a fresh treatment of the entire UFO subject. It is, uh, discusses important sightings, contacts, politics, the cover-up, ancient aliens, the bizarre sciences associated with this, um, the idea of disclosure, and uh, offers advice on being both critical and open-minded in today's world. Uh, he hosts his own radio show, a weekly radio show on KGRA. He's a frequent guest on Coast to Coast AM. And he is featured in the new television documentary series, Hangar One. If you've been here before, you have probably heard him talk. He is a wonderful speaker and devilishly handsome. Is it okay to say that? <laughs> so what he's going to talk about uh, today is uh, basically we all know that mainstream media uh, is not going to tell us the truth most of the time. Um, I don't even know if they're capable of it anymore. <laughs> um, so this is definitely true when it comes to UFO stuff. That information is, you would not believe how filtered that information is when it hits the news media, okay? So for 70 years, the media has done the job of the National Security Agency and played a, a, um, 
uh, active or inactive role in keeping us from getting the truth, making our researchers and our, our jobs uh, much harder on finding out what's really going on. So uh, most recently, and we're, uh, our first speaker is going to talk about this a lot. You're going to hear about this. Everybody knows about the gun camera footage being released in the last couple of months. There are several big things that have changed in the UFO world, not only over the last 31 years, where we didn't have a lot of the technology we do now. And um, so the science has, we've reached a point now, there's a lot of changes happening right now, and I think they're going to continue. One of those is our government has never in any way, directly or indirectly, um, released gun camera footage. Okay? Um, the significance of something like this can't be overstated. Um, and several of our speakers are going to go into this in detail. So this is a big thing, even though it might not seem like it. We've all seen better UFO pictures than was in those videos. Okay, but you think of the broader picture of what this does to the public. So um, something is happening now. We also have tools at our disposal to investigate this phenomenon that we never had before. We have lots of people coming out of the woodwork and saying, I was involved. Like the, the whistleblowers are coming out of the woodwork much more than they ever have before. Something is changing in this phenomenon, and we're much uh, more prepared to, to uh, deal with it. So our first speaker is going to analyze this, as well as the long history of media misinformation and disinformation on this subject, and more importantly, analyze where it's all going. Please join me in welcoming Richard Dolan. Thank you, Forrest. It's a pleasure seeing you again. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Very glad to be here. Very, very glad to be here. Um, I don't normally like to inquire of uh, the audience any questions, but I have two that I want to ask you. So is there anyone here who considers themselves very, very new to the subject of UFOs? Would you mind raising your hand? I'd like to see. One, not many. Is there anyone who is at this or at a, is this their first UFO conference ever? Oh, quite a few more. Well, let me just say that uh, you've picked a very good one to come to. Uh, there are some good conferences around this country, but this, the Ozark Mountain UFO Conference is without a doubt one of the very best. Um, there's always excellent people here, and you'll find, as you, if, if you haven't already, that what really makes the conference amazing isn't, isn't me and isn't the speakers. Uh, it's meeting all of the other attendees. Every conference I go to, I know that I learn more from you than you could ever possibly learn from me. And uh, it's just wonderful to be here. You get the camaraderie. We get uh, connections. It's very important. So welcome. And I hope you have a great experience this weekend. Um, those are my two questions. Okay, good. <laughs> oh, the only other thing I just want to mention before I get started is um, following up on, on Forrest. I, I can guarantee you I will not have time for questions at the end. It's never going to happen. Um, I will gladly chat with all of you. I would encourage you not to uh, speak with me after I'm done here. Let me go down to my table, which is right downstairs, and we can chat there. I've got a nice table, and uh, we can talk all the way. And I'd be very happy to do that with you. So um, uh, it's true. I've been researching UFOs for about 25 years, and I'm not going to go into that whole thing, how it started. It was interesting. I was... Uh, knew nothing about this subject, and I was just studying history um, in a graduate program, Cold War, the Soviets, the birth of the CIA, and stumbled into this subject of the UFO reality and cover-up, and I just thought, I'll take two months out of my life and find out what's going on here, and that was 25 years ago. So there is definitely something going on. Um, <clears throat> along the way, a lot of other questions opened up. You know, it wasn't simply, is this real? Was this a concern of our national security establishment? That I was qu quickly satisfied. Oh, yes, they're quite, quite interested. But then some other questions obviously arise. You know, like, well, if this is all real, then where has the media been all this time? And so that takes you down another different rabbit hole of trying to understand what is our media? What does it do? Uh, what is its purpose and who's running it and so forth. And it's funny, when I started researching this in the 90s, our world was in a very different place, I think, than it is now. 
Uh, today, it's really no big deal to say, oh, sure, the media is controlled. Try doing that even in the 90s, and you'd get a lot of more raised eyebrows, I think. But we've really gone through some changes in our society. So um, I want to go into that. And I've got, I have a lecture in uh, four parts. I'm going to go over that with you in just a moment. The only other thing I just want to mention is that uh, for me, personally and professionally, it's been a, a busy year. I have a lot of projects that I am working on. I am doing, I've been saying this for way too long, but a, a forthcoming book on the subject of false flags. If you don't know what that is, maybe I'll get to chat about it briefly today. But um, that is a history that I'm working on, and I've just created a, a separate website to go along with my publishing website, which, was, which is Richard Dolan Press. I have another website, uh, Richard Dolan Members, and uh, you can learn about that at some point. Uh, my lecture here is in four parts. I'm trying to break this down as logically as I can for us. Uh, part one will be what I call the media control system. Part two will be uh, moving to the relationship of the media to UFOs historically. And then part three will be the historical challenge posed to that system of control. You'll see what I mean when we get there. And then four, uh, our current situation where we find ourselves now with a lot of the recent revelations about um, UFOs in the military. So let me get right started into this, the media control system. Uh, I don't think you need me to explain this to you. The mainstream media is not your friend. That's an interesting quote. That's Roger Ailes, formerly president of Fox News. Um, the truth is whatever people will believe. Mainstream media lies. Mainstream media spins. Mainstream media censors. Do they do that all the time, every single day. Mainstream media is owned by six corporations. You probably all knew that. Six corporations own, I think, something like 90% of anything that most people are likely to see, read, or hear in the course of their day. You know, it was different 50-plus years ago when you had 50-plus corporations, and 100 years ago it was even more than that. Uh, consolidations and mergers do that. Um, but also, the mainstream media, your news media, has really merged with popular culture and the entertainment industry. This wasn't the case so much 50 years ago when you'd watch Walter Cronkite on TV, um, where the news media at least had a pretense of attempting some level of dignity and objectivity. Now it's, it's all one big entertainment. Um, and of course, the mainstream media has cooperated with the intelligence community for a very long time, and I'll get more into that in just a moment. And then the other interesting thing about the mainstream media is that it does literally make us sick. It makes you sick. What do I mean by that? Well, this is an article during the election a couple of years ago. We remember that 2016 election, I guess. BuzzFeed, this election is literally making us sick. The Guardian, news is bad for you, and giving up reading will make you happier. You probably knew this, but there's actually a lot of research behind it. And, um, it's a truism, and it's true, that uh, individuals, for example, dealing with anxiety or other psychological issues, they go to see a therapist. If the therapist is any good, they'll say, uh, stay away from the news for a little while. There is a reason for that. And, you know, the official reason is, well, the news is, is distressing, which it is. But, you know, ask yourself a question. Why is it that learning about the world around you should make you sick? or should give you anxiety? Should it really be that way? Or is it, I would suggest, the manner of our news media, our explicit news media? You know, there is news that can, I mean, it's in, in theory, news is simply information coming to you about your world. Why would you not want that? But our form of news does make us sick, and I would uh, suggest there is a reason for this. News doesn't just make us sick, it destabilizes entire societies. Uh, this is Venezuela, this is kind of stuff is going on right now. Uh, Brazil, during their recent um, Western media inspired demonstrations that took out the elected president of that country, Dilma Rousseff, uh, in what was known as a Wall Street coup of 2016. Macedonia, we don't really hear much about these countries, but what um, is interesting about all of them is that you've got US-sponsored media assaults on the legitimacy of governments in place, 
to destabilize those societies and the mainstream media under Western control is instrumental. And then of course, this was uh, in Berkeley about a year ago when Milo Yiannopoulos tried to speak at the Berkeley campus. Um, I would definitely suggest also contributed greatly by mainstream media uh, build up to um, this type of thing. So I think mainstream media causes a lot of this type of stuff. And uh, don't just trust me, trust this lady. This is Amber Lyon. She was a CNN journalist. She was uh, covering the Arab Spring of 2011 for CNN, not that long ago. And uh, she's gone out there. She's like a lot of good journalists. She's gone rogue and has stated that um, CNN was routinely paid by the US government and foreign governments and foreign governments to selectively report on certain events, that is spin, right? And, um, and to make up fake or false news stories. She said that. And that's considered shocking, like, oh my God, we should be astonished that such a thing would happen. She's a three-time Emmy Award winner, by the way. Not too bad, and that's what she has to say about this. Um, but she's not the only one. This is a, a man that I, I would almost say, uh, well, revere is hard, a strong word, but certainly I hold Michel Shosodovsky in very great esteem. And he runs the website known as globalresearch.ca. I recommend it to everyone. It's an excellent alternative to the indoctrination that uh, is being thrown at you every single day. Um, a recent article by Shosodovsky, who is behind fake news, fake videos and images. I'm just gonna show you a couple of this. This article just simply appeared earlier this month in uh, 2018. Um, so, for example, he points out, um, this is an alleged video footage of a, a terror attack in Brussels um, uh, from March 22nd, 2016. And this was, um, CNN covered this, BBC covered this, other mainstream covered it, and they're showing you no, an, yet another terror attack. It's not that this video is not Brussels, and in fact, they are two separate events, both which occurred in Russia several years earlier. The reality, this video here, this is, this is not Brussels airport, this is Moscow's Domodedovo International Airport from January 2011. You can see it's the same scene here. And you can even see the fake timestamp, March 22nd, 2016. Someone put that on there and put that out. That's very interesting. And then the second video, this is also purporting to be Brussels, the same event, was a different event also in Russia, in Minsk, in April of 2011. And you can, you can see clearly, same place. Okay, so that's one. And obviously when CNN and BBC learn, or when they're caught, they issue the standard apologies. And we were mistaken in our haste, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what you really have to ask is two separate fake videos from two separate Russian events in one day for the same event, you're going to tell me that that's a mistake? Sure. Um, Shosodovsky went on, and in his same article, he cites this article. Uh, back in 2012, I think, yes. The lies that the United States perpetrates about the nation of Syria are far too vast for me to document here. It uh, suffice to say it's been an interest of mine since the United States unofficially declared war on Syria in 2011, seven years ago, and they have sought since that time to destabilize and partition and jihadify that country. Um, the lies have never stopped about Syria, and they continue this very week. But this is an article Shosodevsky cited from 2012. Syria massacre in Hula condemned as an outrage. These are, these are bodies of children, so, sorry to say. And they put this in here in 2012. This actually is a photograph from Iraq in 2003 taken by this, uh, no, not this, this is, sorry. The photograph was taken by Marco Delorio in Iraq in 2003, and it was cited in this article down here. So in other words, someone pulled out a nine-year-old photograph from a totally different situation and inserted it into uh, an alleged event, an alleged non-existent massacre by 
the Syrian government back in 2012. It's just one example of countless, actually, that have occurred relating to Syria. Um, this is a BBC and CNN. So here, this one's BBC, a celebration in India after the, said to be in, in Libya, after the uh, ouster of uh, Muammar Gaddafi in Libya. And BBC put out this video saying, these are Libyans celebrating. It's actually a celebration in India, different part of the world, having nothing to do with Libyans, but they pulled that in there, um, mainly because there weren't those celebrations that they were trying to promote. And CNN does the same thing. This is a protest said to be in China in 2008. This is actually in India, uh, near Tibet. Uh, these things are just pulled in for their own political purposes and spin. It's not even unusual, it's the norm. That's, that was all of Shosodovsky stuff, but you could spend days and weeks and months and years citing literally fake, falsified news video being used all the time by our media. Um, this man no longer is alive, unfortunately. This is Dr. Udolf Ufkota, who um, a couple of years ago became uh, very well known out on YouTube and in the news media, a German journalist, who just said, we all lie for the CIA. And his story was that he... Um, as a journalist in Europe, was given stories by the CIA about Libya and others, other uh, situations, and just so to, uh, told to put his name as the byline of the story. They were actually writing the stories. And he said, if I hadn't done that, it would have been the end of my career. He said, every European journalist, every major European journalist is controlled, he said, by the CIA. He was very articulate. He died about a year and a half ago of a heart attack. He was in his 50s. Um, so that's his story. Uh, there is a program called Mockingbird, was a program called Mockingbird. All of these things that I've discussed are nothing new. They may sound new to people if you haven't really dived into this subject, but this is not new. Mockingbird was a program during the Cold War created by the CIA. It was a media control operation. It was outed, uncovered, during uh, first the Senate investigations of the intelligence community in 1975, when it first came out that, oh my goodness, the CIA controls the media? And Carl Bernstein of Watergate fame uh, wrote an article for Rolling Stone, actually of all places, on this whole thing. This is the article, the CIA and the media, um, in which he, let's say, outed the program. And the revelation at that time, and this was a huge deal, was that upwards of 400 American journalists, or more, realistically, were on the CIA payroll. It's a lot of people. Now, I don't know that you could control the media completely if you secretly had 400 mainstream journalists working for you, but you could probably do a lot. Uh, you could certainly kill off stories. You could ridicule stories out of existence. You could create fake stories. Sure, you could. You could control editorial spin of countless newspapers, which, of course, they did and mo no more. Back in those days, journalists considered it their patriotic duty. It was the Cold War, we had the Russians, the communists to think about, and it wasn't difficult at all to get people on board for that type of a program. Um, and when I mean fake news, I mean literally fake news was being planted all throughout. Uh, not typically within this country, at least my understanding is that uh, the fake, the truly false news stories were planted overseas uh, internationally for often for purposes of regime change. In Iran in 1953, for example, CIA created fake news stories internationally that would then come back to the US to energize public opinion for a coup. They did it again to Guatemala in 1954. They did it in Cuba in 1961. So creating fake news stories explicitly um, the wire services, Associated Press, UPI, would dutifully bring those stories back to American readers here in the United States. Uh, those stories were distributed as genuine news. They were not. Um, a lot of other studies done on the CIA's manipulation of not just our news media, but our culture in general. It's a funny thing, when I was a lot younger, thinking I knew everything, um, I once encountered, a, <laughs> I once encountered a, a, a journalist who had come back from Central America. 
This was back in the 1980s. I was like 22 years old, I think. And, um, and she said, you know, the CIA controls all the news down there. And I'll never forget, I just thought, she's crazy. <laughs> I actually thought that. Well, she wasn't crazy, and I was simply very naive. Uh, but it goes far beyond news media. This is a, an interesting book. These are getting kind of old. I should update this, but I like them both. Uh, Francis Stoner Saunders wrote a very excellent book about CIA control over um, cultural institutions during the Cold War in the 60s, called the Cultural Cold War. So you think these organizations um, are independent, and of course they're not independent. It's a very deft way back then for the CIA to manage cultural debate. Um, this one is a, a very interesting book on the CIA's relationship to academia, uh, Cloak and Gown, by a guy named Robin Winks, uh, basically about Yale University, but it's really, CIA deals with a lot of universities. Um, and segueing onto the UFO subject is a, a very, very good book by a gentleman who has presented in the past here at this very conference. Unfortunately, Terry Hansen died a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm sure many of you remember him. I miss him. Uh, this is a very fine book Terry wrote uh, called The Missing Times, News Media Complicity in the UFO Cover-Up. And I want to segue to that segment right now. So that's on to part two, the media and UFOs. So, you know, when you hear about Project Operation Mockingbird in the news media nowadays, Mockingbird supposedly ended. The CIA said, well, yes, we did that. We had relationships with journalists back then. If you listen to the CIA talk about this now, it's like you can tell they've had long conversations with their lawyers because everything is very exactly worded. We no longer have paid relationships with American journalists for the purpose of falsifying news, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, okay. First of all, they don't even necessarily need to pay these people formally. Well, they probably do, but... Um, but the journalists just jump over each other to have such a relationship with the CIA. It's not just the CIA, by the way, it's the Pentagon, which spends huge sums of money every year to influence social media and the news. And of course, you know, there's a revolving door between uh, the Pentagon and news media anyway. Good grief, NBC just hired, um, was it Clapper? No, who's one of the ex-CIA chiefs they just hired again? It's like brought to you directly from CIA. NBC is loaded with ex-CIA people giving you the news. Yeah, nothing suspicious about that. Um, so, so the U uh, Mockingbird has n formally ended, but it's in fact expanded. Now with the UFO subject, I'll just say, um, if you doubt that UFOs are an important matter of national security, you need to think again. Um, one of the very crystal clear things about this subject, and we know this through, fortunately, our golden era where um, during the late 70s in particular, in the Freedom of Information Act, golden age, it's not that we don't get good documents out of government these days, but in the 70s it happened really for the first time that researchers were able to petition the government for documents relating to UFOs, and they were able to get them to the shock of many people. And, uh, these documents were hardcore. They described airspace violations by objects that were of sensitive military bases, of objects that were not supposed to exist, that looked like disks that maneuvered in ways described in these military reports that um, allowed them easily to evade all attempts to intercept. I mean, you have to ask yourself what's going on here, all through the 40s and 50s and 60s and beyond. Uh, at the same time, the government's telling the public that there's nothing to UFOs. Well, there certainly was and is a great deal to UFOs, and it is a matter of national security. Therefore, of course, UFOs are going to be part of the Mockingbird system for you to manage the news so that you and I are getting the news that we're, in the minds of our elites, appropriate for us and not the stuff that's not appropriate for us. So um, that's because UFOs are an important part of, um, have an effect on national security. Um, I did an earlier version of this lecture about a year ago with a much more detailed history of the media relationship to UFOs. This is very, very short and all I'll just say here is that 
Um, the establishment media, and there is an establishment media, we're talking New York Times, all throughout the last 70 years has been a key part of that in terms of newspapers, Washington Post, Ditto, and the other major newspapers. And then going through our own era, where you're talking about the establishment uh, TV news media. All of them have consistently been hostile to the subject of UFOs. Now, we'll take it right up to December of 2017 when certain things seem to change. I'll come up to that. But there's been a long history of hostility and ridicule and dismissiveness toward the subject of UFOs. The one exception that you can say over the uh, last 70 years would be with smaller media, local newspapers, what would then, I guess, constitute, if there was any such thing as an alternative media, that would be it. In lo local newspaper coverage, you would see a uh, more sympathetic portrayal of UFO, uh, flying saucer, and so forth. Um, this I want to mention very briefly, this was, uh, there's Walter Cronkite, uh, a very well-known uh, CBS UFO special from 1966. You can find this on YouTube, it's quite interesting. Um, friend, foe, or fantasy. Nice set up in the title for what they want you to think the UFOs are. Cronkite ends it with these words. You gotta love this. No evidence that anything out there has come here. One thing is clear. You could not keep a spaceship a secret. It's impossible. The news media would be all over it. They would love that scoop. It would be the scoop of a lifetime. And then he said, moreover, these reports, these UFO reports, are probably best handled by scientists and the military. Let them take care of it. You don't really need to worry about this. This is Walter Cronkite speaking. By the way, that program featured a nice little clip of a young Carl Sagan who uh, I don't know if he introduced the phrase pseudoscience, but uh, he used it very early on to describe the UFO subject on this documentary, pseudoscience. Very interesting. Um, and a, a typical of all of these mainstream establishment treatments of UFOs, it's they, they treat it like you would treat a balloon. You inflate it, and then you deflate it. And so the first half of the documentary, they inflate that balloon to make you think, wow, maybe there's something to UFOs after all. And then they deflate it and you think, oh, no, fake evidence, not real, no, and so forth. And so you're left at the end. It's a very typical, typical tactic. Uh, what we know about that particular special is that it was coordinated with the CIA. And we know this. This is a letter from a man named uh, Thornton Page who had been a member years before of the famous, infamous Robertson panel. That was a CIA-sponsored panel in 1953, and um, it was about UFOs, and they concluded by saying, we really need to get a handle on this for, as far as the public is concerned. We need to get the debunking message out there. We need to work with major media to do it. It was all a given for these guys, like, no big deal. Let's get the media to work with us. And of course, they did. Anyway, the Robertson panel uh, conclusions were intimately rela related to that CBS special, according to Robertson panel member Thornton Page. So, a um, little segue here relating to a newspaper known as the National Enquirer, we've probably all heard of it. Um, the late Terry Hansen, who I, I cited him a little earlier, did a lot of excellent work on the National Enquirer and UFOs and the CIA, and I wanna just recap a little bit of it for you because it, it's important. Uh, the Enquirer, was bought by this man here in 1952, Gene Pope, Generoso Pope Jr. He paid $75,000 for it. It was the New York Enquirer before that. He uh, ponied up some money. It was a lot of money at the time. Um, it, it's unclear how and where that money came from. And uh, within a couple of years of buying it, he turned it into a sensationalist tabloid, which we all know about. Hadn't been a sensationalist prior to that. Um, there are rumors that he was, um, that some of the money came from a mob, the very famous mobster Frank Costello, totally possible. Uh, what is known is that Gene Pope had worked for the CIA's Psychological Warfare Unit in 1951. He allegedly left the CIA the year he bought the Enquirer. 
Whether he left or not, I don't know, but he did work for the CIA and worked for their psychological warfare unit. So then he buys this newspaper, all right? Uh, oh, yes, nice, nice little sidelight. John Kenneth Galbraith, who was a uh, famous economist, was also an ambassador to India under the Kennedy administration. He said, you know, I was in India, and there was a newspaper very similar to the National Enquirer, and he learned that it was financed also by the CIA. Just a little sidelight. So Gene Pope, um, you know, you'd wonder, why would this guy who's publishing a sensationalist tabloid be buddies with people like Richard Nixon and Secretary of Defense Melvin Laird? And how would Gene Pope get these sweetheart deals to get his newspaper into the Winn-Dixie grocery store chain so it appears at all of the checkout lines and everyone buys it? Nice little score. Um, people were always amazed by Gene Pope's connections. And on one occasion, someone asked him, said, how do, you, how do you get in with the White House so easily? And Pope just enigmatically said, well, you know, one hand washes the other, whatever that means. The Inquirer in the 1970s began doing very serious, good UFO news reportage. This is uh, Bob Pratt's article. Bob Pratt was, was their main UFO writer. He had a bigger budget for investigating UFO stories than probably any other journalist in the world, very possibly. Um, the Inquirer gave him money to go on site and actually do genuine journalism. This is a genuine story from 1977 that Pratt did on UFOs at nuclear bases and missile sites. This is, and only two years after the fact, he was writing about it. And those were important uh, sightings and they remain important historically to this day. And the Inquirer of all newspapers broke that story. What is going on with that? This newspaper also gave you Elvis scene in the supermarket and the Bermuda Triangle and just Charlie's Angels and same newspaper. What is going on? Well, the role of the Inquirer, I think it's very clear, is to, what did Pope mean by one hand washes the other? Well, you take genuine information, you make it ridiculous, by placing it within the context of something as ridiculous as the Inquirer. Really simple. It's like getting an inoculation against the virus. You know, the, the doctor gives you a little bit of that virus. It's inert. Your body deals, uh, develops antibodies to fight it, and you are immune. You've been inoculated. Same thing with news and information. They give you that truth, but it's packaged in such a way that you think, oh, well, that's ridiculous, and you then become inoculated against it. That's the way it is. Bob Pratt even became the editor of the MUFON UFO Journal for a few years. And by the way, I'm not even trying to impugn him. Uh, I never met him, but he seemed like a genuine journalist. And, you know, journalists are just trying to get a job, make their money. I understand that. But I think when you have to see the bigger picture here, he was fulfilling a role. And that role actually served the interests of the CIA. Um, meanwhile, during that whole period of the 70s and, you know, with the Inquirer doing its thing, the mainstream media, what was then the mainstream, just totally ignored UFOs. Um, all those Freedom of Information Act documents that were then being uh, released. Now, the, you know, the documents that came out at that time were not highest level, top secret. They were typically classified secret or confidential or restricted, somewhat lower levels of classification, but they still were confidential classified documents at the time. And they still describe some very amazing things without a doubt. And they certainly proved the lie of the various agencies of the government that denied anything to do with UFOs. So you'd think that would be a big story at the time. I spent a lot of time researching that historically for my second volume of history of UFOs in the national security state. And I really tried to understand, like, during that period, these revelations were coming out. And I have a hard time imagining bigger bombshell revelations than these types of documents that were then being 
obtained by dedicated UFO researchers. You know, two fiery disks were sighted over the uranium mines located in the southern part of the Belgian Congo. Uh, the disks glided in elegant curves and changed their position many times and on and on and on. You know, the matter of, this is a famous FBI document from 1949 of unidentified aircraft, unidentified aerial phenomena, otherwise known as flying disks, flying saucers, is considered top secret by intelligence officers of the Army and the Air Force. Those are important, and yet the mainstream media utterly, absolutely, completely ignore them. If you lived through the 70s and you um, weren't looking for it, you'd never know that any of this stuff came out. I was busy watching the Yankees in the World Series. What did I know? I was a teenager. The information wasn't coming out. It was out, but it wasn't being reported to us. So, fortunately for us, the world changed. What changed? This little crazy thing called the internet happened. Remember the 90s or is this the 80s? And those little computers. It's hard, even now, you know, I think back on the transformation that has taken place in our society over the past 25 plus years and the, uh, the changes that have been generated by this new invention, the internet, the interconnectivity of computers. Um, and like any new development, it's, it's really impossible to foresee what the world would be like. I don't think any of us back in 1990 could have predicted um, the world that we have today in terms of ease of transferring information, the ability to have a Skype voice, face, communication with someone on the other side of the world easily. Um, the ability to have the entire world's encyclopedia collection on your phone at any given moment and everything else that we can imagine. The GPS yourself, wherever, all of that. None of that was predictable. But one thing that even the young internet did, it was very obvious. Even before we had a graphical user interface of the World Wide Web, there were these bulletin boards. There was Alt Paranet UFO, Alt Visitors Aliens. I used to go to them. I'm sure many of you also did. And, and what was unique about them is that this was just information from people throwing stuff up there. There was no censor, there was no filter. As tiny as that internet was by our standards today, it was enough to cause a, a radical shift. It actually ended up exploding ufology itself in the late 80s, early 90s, but that's another story. But the internet did give us, uh, all of us, a new freedom of exchanging information. Um, and it created what we now know as the alternative media. It wasn't possible before that. Um, you know, as the 90s progressed into the 21st century, um, our connectivity became better, our capabilities became better, and certain small groups created organizations that were alternative news organizations, and boom, the next thing you know, you've got groups competing with the major mainstream media. So, of course, it's very clear to see how the reaction has been. First reaction that the mainstream has done and the establishment did for the longest time that they were able to was simply to ignore the development, to look, at, look down their nose at it. Oh, yeah, these bloggers and all of this, looking at it is not credible. Um, and then uh, in the last uh, decade or a little bit more, you see the... Um, transformation of that into the um, ridicule, which definitely uh, has ramped up and um, in the last two years has gone to a completely different level of calling it, going from ridicule to actually now calling it dangerous fake news that you must be protected from. Um, and that's simply the defensive reaction of an institution that knows 
it is on the losing side of history. And so the more it looks desperate for them, the more desperate they act, uh, which is why uh, they are, you know, working. I mean, they're working overtime to get Google, to get Facebook, to get YouTube, to shut down alternative news that they consider to be fake. And, you know, you may not like the so-called alt-right. You may not like Alex Jones. Be my guest, or you may like him. But you know what? If you let them shut people like that down, you're next. And by you, I mean the UFO field is next. You mark my words. The UFO subject is inherently subversive. And if you think for an instant that the algorithms that are now being put into place to censor out uh, other types of news are not going to be used against the UFO subject, you just wait and see. Um, I think it's very, very likely, and I would almost say probable within five years. Um, The other thing that you see in the last 20 years with what we call mainstream is that it's just become absolutely crazy, crazy. Um, I think this is its way of trying to compete with the web, with the alternative news, with YouTube now to get your attention because they know they actually suck. They, I mean, they know they're, pardon my language, they know they're terrible. They know they're terrible. And they know that YouTube blows them out of the water. YouTube as a, as a medium, as a tool, so vastly surpasses anything that the cable or the news television system has in place, they know that they cannot compete. They will lose every time in terms of content, in terms of uh, ease of use, in terms of the accuracy of information. They lose every time. And so they're now in this desperate position where they are seeking, using Google and YouTube, which is owned by Google, uh, using Facebook, to work for on their behalf. Um, And by the way, you know, everyone's upset with Facebook these days, but what Facebook has been doing, Facebook has been getting into your business for a lot longer than this last year. And um, Facebook has been giving all of your information over to any three-letter agency that, uh, that it asks including the CIA. Facebook is the ultimate surveillance tool, and it's perfect for this world today uh, in terms of especially the generation of my children who are about 20 years of age uh, who've grown up not even thinking about privacy at all, like who cares about privacy? The whole idea is to put their lives out there. I do believe that that's part of a cultural, an intentional cultural Um, brainwashing to get people increasingly just not to care about privacy and Facebook is the ultimate tracking tool. Anyway, what we see is our mainstream has continued to get crazier. It's integrated itself with pop culture uh, more and more and they have continued uh, by and large to ridicule UFOs. There is an alternative media uh, this isn't even really all that alternative. Like, there's Billy Cox over at the Herald Tribune. He's a mainstream writer on UFOs who has the, has the courage to put out very good pieces. Um, Lee Spiegel wrote for years for the Huffington Post, did very good UFO work. This is uh, an interview on RT featuring uh, the Honorable Paul Hellyer, former Minister, uh, Minister of Defense of Canada, um, on one of the shows on RT. And uh, there's, you know, there are uh, alternative media websites, there are other websites you can go to that have good information on UFOs. Um, Nothing is certain, of course, but um, certainly better than what you get in the establishment that poses as hip. The Daily Beast loves to pose as this hip kind of current, you know, There's a nice little hipster beard, this guy here at the Daily Beast. But really, and Mother Jones, but they all love to ridicule UFOs. This is an article. This was uh, in the aftermath of the citizen hearing uh, in Washington, D.C., organized by Stephen Bassett. I participated 
in that citizen hearing, I think every day that it convened for that week in April of 2013. The media response to that was uniformly ridiculed, dismissive, the mainstream. Um, what what uh, this guy here, I love pointing this one out, Josh Deziza, he writes, citizens hearing on disclosure, a faux hearing about alien encounters after truthers and false flags an old school conspiracy theory with benign little green men flying saucers uh, almost seems refreshing. Though you wouldn't know it from the weary faces of the former members of Congress listening to testimony. First of all, that's a lie. I was there. Those members of Congress were not weary. They were into it. I will tell you, every one of them. And I know because I spoke to them and I saw their transformation over the course of a week. And uh, some of those people are active and promoting the UFO subject to this day, including former Senator Mike Gravel of Alaska, who I saw just a, less than a year ago at an event where we both were. Um, so no, totally untrue. But now the thing about the Daily Beast, I just wanted to point out, I did some research on them. This is typical. You could do this on any of these so-called independent, hip, newspapers, on the web, web blogs. Daily Beast is owned by a group called Interactive Corporation, IAC. They are themselves a holding company. They got like 150 companies. They, in turn, are owned by, oh, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase, Morgan Stanley, BlackRock, all financial concerns. I looked up the ownership of IAC. It's all major finance. But they like to hide behind little hipster beards like this to make themselves look cool. This is really what it's all about. So you've got major finance running it all. You know, Chomsky talked about this 40 years ago. You've got the establishment really controlling both sides of the spectrum, the so-called left and the so-called right. That controls the parameters of debate, what is permissible to be discussed in our society. And it's absolutely true. But what is always off limits is to take this subject seriously. And the Washington Post has really been the worst of the bunch. I used to think it was the New York Times, but no, it's the Washington Post. And uh, no one else, none of the other newspapers, are, at least, are even close. The Post, I just am astonished at the sleaziness of and the depths to which they would go to smear the UFO subject. They're almost as bad as the UK. The UK is the worst. BBC just is out of control with UFOs. But the Post is their equal in smarminess, smugness, and just, uh, you know, and, and in lack of genuine information. That's the thing. Their, their whole thing after the citizen hearing was, uh, you know, this is what a congressional hearing looks like in some kind of bizarro parallel universe conspiracy, religion, this is all the post. Clap if you believe in fairies, squint upward if you believe in UFOs. Um, Washington Post is now owned by Jeff Bezos. He bought it, in fact, shortly after these articles came out at the end of 2013. Bezos is the richest man in the world, we're told. Um, it was after he bought the post after Amazon won the cloud computing contract for the CIA and all the other three-letter agencies of the U.S. intelligence community. So Amazon does their cloud computing. Bezos won a contract. And with that money, actually half of that amount of money, bought the post, which so obviously does the work for the U.S. national security community. All you have to do is read, read it. <laughs> it's very obvious. So that takes our world right up until today. So what it looked like, right, is that through our own time, the mainstream has worked very assiduously to get back on the good foot. That is to uh, counteract this threat from the last 20 years of alternative media. That's what it looked like. And it looked like maybe, maybe they were doing it, you know? And then we get this uh, series of articles in December of uh, 2017. The New York Times published two articles on that day. These are the articles, all right? And um, 
Two days later, the Washington Post publishes a few articles. One of these in the New York Times, and these are the Post saying, hmm, something going on here after all. This particular article here is a very interesting one by the Times. This uh, Commander David Fravor, U.S. Navy pilot. And the article describes a very interesting encounter that he had off the coast of California, Southern California, in November of 2004 with another Navy pilot of an unknown object that um, was quite extraordinary and unexplainable. An object that had been tracked, or actually objects, plural, had been tracked by the U.S. Navy uh, carrier group. The USS Eldridge and the USS Princeton were in the area tracking UFOs for the past two weeks prior to that event. Objects as high as 80,000 feet dropping rapidly to 20,000 feet maneuvering in ways that we just don't know how to do, apparently. Anyway, it's described in this article in somewhat of a detail. This article here, goofy title when you really think about it, Glowing Auras and Black Money, the Pentagon's Mysterious UFO Program. They can't lay off. And why does the New York Times have to use periods for the acronym UFO? Can they please? The entire world says UFO. We don't put periods in there, New York Times. It's about time after, I just, they can't take that pole out of their behind. They just can't do it. Um, so the revelations of the articles, the primary revelations are, let me go through these, that the Pentagon spent ah, a few million dollars, $22 million on UFO research from, not, from 2007 to 2012. It's not that long ago. It's not ancient history. Now, $22 million in the context of Pentagon spending is practically not even visible. They get $700 billion every year. So $22 million over five years, you think that's not very much, which it isn't. Nonetheless... That's millions of dollars on something that's supposed to be ridiculous. What's going on with that? The program was known as the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, managed by this gentleman, Luis Elizondo, always described in every release as a career intelligence officer. Well, because that's what he was. Elizondo had a lot of quotes, not just in the New York Times piece here, but he had a lot of... Um, he's been very public, and he's been... He's had interesting things to say about this, for sure. Uh, we had never seen anything like it or beyond next generation. When you, when you think about it, beyond next generation. Next generation is cool enough. This is beyond that. So presumably the technologies that their program were studying, these UFOs, were beyond that. So stuff that we couldn't figure out how to do. The article in the New York Times, if, um, one of them discussed recovered materials that were being held and studied by Robert Bigelow's company, Bigelow Aerospace, which had the contract to look at all this stuff. Uh, the New York Times article said these were metal alloys, mysterious metal alloys that were being studied. Well, that's interesting. You know, for uh, years, UFO researchers had made allegations and claims that there had been crash retrievals and that the military had recovered objects and pieces like Roswell. And skeptics would laugh, ridicule, call people delusional and, and the like. And suddenly you have this almost blasé language in the New York Times article, frankly, stating, oh yes, um, materials have been recovered in our study. Me metal alloys. Um, I'm going to come back to that in a moment. And of course, then the other big revelation uh, was, as I kind of mentioned, Fravor's extraordinary encounter in November of 04. He called it the Tic Tac UFO because it looked like a large Tic Tac. It was Tic Tac shape. 
one of the things he said about that in uh, one of his interviews that he gave afterward, actually several. So the object was seen on radar again, and the um, and Fravor and another pilot were ordered to investigate and intercept. So they are directed out to <clears throat> the location of the object, and Fraser's, Fravor said he saw it visually. He said it was at either on the water or possibly just below the water or maybe just above the water, but it was very low over the ocean. And he said he could actually see the ocean uh, frothing and in motion underneath this object or around this object. So he circles around and starts going in. And he said at that point this object came up at, toward him. Uh, that would strike me as somewhat aggressive. He's really, I'm sure if, if many of you have listened to him, he's just a very interesting guy. And I think he was fascinated. It didn't seem to scare him. He just came at it. And then he said the object shot off very rapidly and zoomed up and out and gone. Gone. Two seconds, he said, it was out of visibility. Now, visibility, he said, was 10 miles easy. And then he said, but actually, if you want to get real, it was actually all closer to 50 miles. But to be conservative, he said he, he had an easy visibility of 10 miles. And he said this object disappeared from visibility within two seconds. So I just did my own little math. I'm no mathematician, but I've got a calculator. And at two seconds, covering 10 miles in two seconds is like 18,000 miles per hour. It's quite fast. If you want to go by a 50-mile disappearance, just multiply by five. It's very ridiculously fast. Uh, I don't think there's anything... Now, Fravor was estimating, I assume, but nonetheless, this object was pretty amazing. Um, the mainstream media's follow-up coverage of this... This is Fravor's interview here where he stated what I just said to you. He was talking on Fox to Tucker Carlson about that. That's a very interesting interview. And, and Carlson was very interested in this encounter. And I, in my opinion, said a lot of the right things that you would actually want to hear a TV journalist state. It's unusual. Uh, here's Elizondo giving an interview on CNN. Um, most of the uh, coverage, particularly um, the television coverage that I have noticed in the aftermath of this was actually fairly positive. Um, a lot of the web-based and print-based coverage was much more negative, uh, but the TV coverage was quite positive overall, um, but it's definitely slowed down. So you get a situation where this little flurry came out. And, you know, what was clear is that because the New York Times published these two articles, it essentially gave permission for the rest of the mainstream media for a little while to cover this. And so they're able to do it. Um, so that's kind of a good thing. And you might ask, okay, well, why, why has this happened? You know, if... If uh, Dolan's right and you've got this mainstream collaboration with the intelligence community to debunk UFOs, and what is going on here? Why would they do this? Well, I have some ideas about this. Allow me to share. One theory, though, is very simple. This, I call it the conventional theory. Is that, hey, look, nothing conspiratorial here. You just have a situation where good journalists saw a story they decided to break the story. They were careful, they got their facts lined up as well as they could, and there you have it, nothing, to, nothing mysterious. Okay, well, you can accept that if you wish. Uh, or you could remember that the New York Times and the Washington Post, as the voice of the establishment, and that is what they are, had other motives involved. Motive number one, I characterize as cauterizing the wound. Well, what do I mean? Well, I mean that the uh, ATIP 
was going to come out. It was coming out. Why? Because To The Stars Academy, organized and run by former rock star Tom DeLonge, got his people together, including Elizondo, and they had their press conference in October of 2017, shortly before the New York Times article. And uh, it was an impressive group of people there, including Luis Elizondo. Elizondo was talking about this. This information about this Pentagon program was going to break. There is no way that program was not going to break. And so what happens in a situation where if you're managing the news, you have to get out in front of this. And so it is essential that your story, your narrative, your spin get out first. That means you tell the public what, about this, what you want them to know. You have to give a, a couple of goodies away. You know, the best way to keep a secret is to pretend to share it. And so they did give up some of the information. Of course, what you learned in the New York Times article is that, according to the Pentagon, the program ended in 2012. They're not doing it anymore. And then, of course, the article did mention that Elizondo believed the program was continuing. Well, it is continuing. We have multiple confirmations about this from a wide, uh, from a number of good sources that show the program is continuing. But the way that the New York Times packaged it basically gave the reader reason to think it's in the past, it's done, nothing much seemed to come out of it, and let's move on. Um, it's cauterizing the wound. They gave up some information because it was totally unavoidable to do so, and the rest is concealed, and I mean really concealed. It's a limited disclosure. For example, mainstream media has given no follow-up, none that I can see, to Bigelow's alleged possession of recovered materials. When, when any of us read that for the first time, we all did a collective double take. Materials are being held, they're being studied, what are they? Well, the New York Times dishonestly portrayed them as metal alloys. Um, it's now becoming clear that they're not metal alloys. They're metamaterials. They're materials that are difficult for us to categorize. One of the skeptic debunking pieces of all of this came out by a scientist who said, metal alloys, what are you talking about? We know all the metal alloys. There's nothing mysterious about them. So sure, I'm, I'm assuming that that is true, but that's actually not what we're talking about. So one question that I want to know the answer to is how did the phrase metal alloys get into that New York Times piece to begin with? Who wrote it? Whose idea was it? Because it's not true. Um, was it Elizondo? I'm told that it wasn't him. So if it wasn't him, then was it one of the journalists of the New York Times piece or was it one of their bosses? I'd like to know. I, I really would like to know and I bet you would too because that's a bit of disinformation that is that was perfectly designed to throw us off the actual path of what it is we are dealing with. It's a lie. That's the New York Times, that's what they do. Um, there is also in the mainstream been not one bit that I have seen of any self-examination of how and why the media, the mainstream media, has been so dismissive of UFOs all this time. I mean, think about it. Even if you take the New York Times and Washington Post pieces at face value, there's a seriousness there that even they in these pieces acknowledge. So, what about the last 70 years and all of the nasty, snarky dismissiveness? Has there been any mainstream journalist even one time publicly saying, wait a minute, what have we, have we been dismissive of this unfairly? Do we need to revisit this? I haven't seen any, any self-examination whatsoever. 
There's been no follow-up of a really important statement that Elizondo said early on. He said, you know, if this were Russian or Chinese technology invading our airspace with these extraordinary capabilities, our country would be going through craziness right now trying to deal with it. And he said, instead, all I hear is nothing but crickets. And it's very interesting. So within, at least according to what he says, his higher-ups in the Pentagon don't seem to be all that worked up over these violations of airspace and, and these encounters. Um, why not? And where's the media? Why aren't they asking these questions if they're supposed to be watching out for us, but they're not? Um, no one, and this is sort of related to one of the earlier points, a lack of self-examination, no one in the media, the major media, is really questioning the likelihood, or let's just say possibility, of a cover-up and what it means. You know, the fact is that if our military has been dealing with this unknown phenomenon, we can't assume, can we, that it just started in 2004. Well, we kind of know that there's a history before that. There have been claims and encounters and there's data galore going right on back through the decades. And no one is bothering to think publicly, okay, this does look like they've got some secrets here, not hearing a peep out of the media. No investigation, no investigation by the major media that even remotely compares with what is currently going on by private UFO researchers right now. Several who are sitting in this room and several who are in other parts of the world digging deep. And I know because I'm lucky enough, I get to talk to some of them. And uh, I can tell you that it's become widely known now several things, particularly about Fravor's encounter in 2004 that are deadly serious that the media has not covered. The fact that this UFO that he encountered in November of 2004 had the ability to penetrate highly encrypted naval communication systems like that. That has not come out publicly, but that is true. And I've heard it from two specific independent sources. I believe it. And uh, this is very quietly being discussed. It's a serious, significant capability to basically have its way with the best US defense capabilities out there. We, in other words, cannot compete with this thing, with these things whatever they are, that's a significant piece of news. And where is the New York Times? Where is the Washington Post or CNN or Fox, uh, for that matter? Where are they? Because I'm able to get access to this information. A lot of other researchers are able to get access to this information. And yet, they're not touching it. Okay? Uh, there's a lot else that's going on here. The whole concept of the metamaterials as opposed to metal alloys. Why is this not coming out? It's being discussed among good sources that the mainstream media has access to and they're not doing a thing. No one is getting on board with this. Um, and then, yes, I just mentioned this. So, such as the clear indications that the 2004 Tic Tac incident has major national security implications. Mainstream media has ignored all of this and so much more in terms of the major implications of this. So that when, you know, the articles came out and so many people in this field said, this is disclosure, well, let's just take a few steps back and really try to understand what kind of disclosure are we actually talking about here. My conclusion is that this is not a serious effort by the media to inform us. This is a, a true quote 
from former CIA director Bill Casey. He was CIA director during the Reagan years. He said, we'll know our disinformation program is complete when everything the US public believes is false. And that is a confirmed statement. It was uh, recorded by a journalist, Barbara Honiger, who's, she's still around. Uh, she was present when Casey made that statement in 1981. He was a new CIA director. We'll know our disinformation program is complete when everything the US public believes is false. That's the CIA. They're obviously very confident of their ability to control what you believe. They do it through the media. So the establishment media is still totally part of the mockingbird system. That has not been dismantled. That has been expanded and deepened and made vastly more sophisticated than it could ever have been in the 1960s or 1950s. Vastly more. The media will never, and I mean never with a capital N, I should have had, will never give away more than the national security state allows them to. They are not independent. It is the, one of the most pernicious fictions of our era that we have an independent news media. Well, we do, but they're the alternative media. If they're not owned by one of the six major corporations, that's a start. The New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, Fox, and the rest will go so far and then no further. Farthest that I've seen was the Carlson interview on Fox with uh, Fravor. That was a pretty good interview. I will certainly um, say, say that. Uh, but they have not gone any further than that. So, uh, no, this is not a serious effort. If it were a serious effort, there would be constant follow-up on this right now. Now, let me go into some of the recent evidence itself. How am I doing? I've got about 20 minutes, I believe. Um, so this was the press conference from uh, October of 2017, the To The Stars Academy. That's, that's Tom DeLong here. This is uh, Chris Mellon, um, one of the members of the, of the panel, talking about the um, Navy encounter of 2004 at, the, at that moment. And he's got this graphic image behind him. Some of you remember this. It's only a few months ago, and he said, yeah, this photograph is U.S. military, Navy photograph, I think he said Navy. Um, and he said, we can identify, this is the object that, um, that our Navy encountered that utterly outperformed our F-18A Super Hornet uh, interceptors. And you look at that, and that's like, wow, that's amazing, except it's not a UFO, it's a Mylar balloon. It is a Mylar balloon, and, and, and we know exactly the history of that photograph. It was taken in the UK a number of years ago. Um, the reason this appeared, I think, in this presentation here, uh, this image was included in an article from 2015 on Fravor's encounter. Fravor's encounter has been known since 2007, I believe. It was written about in Above Top Secret. Um, in 2015, the encounter was written about by a colleague, a federal fighter jet pilot of Fravers named Paco Chirio. It's actually a really good article, and he wrote extensively about Fravers' incredible encounter and um, on an aviation site called Fighter Sweep. Article was fine, and the image, all that this author did was he, like a lot of authors do on the internet, they, he took a a variety of um, stock UFO photos and, and dressed up the article with them. That's all he did. And he took this image of a Mylar balloon and included it in his article. He shouldn't have done that, but it wasn't like the greatest sin in the world. What was the greatest sin is that this whole team did not bother to investigate the photograph. How is such sloppy incompetence these are all like CIA and skunk works and these are like heavy duty high level guys. You would think that they would have gotten their act together. How did that happen? That has not been answered to my knowledge, but uh, it was a very bad rollout of this program. Um, but onto the evidence itself, the Tic Tac video 
Yeah, this has been known since 2007 on Above Top Secret. There's a lot of debate about that video. You know, when it came out in uh, February of 07, there was a very good uh, discussion and analysis that was done about it at the time. Um, a really excellent analyst, he's still around, he still writes, Isaac Coy, he's always worth reading in my opinion. Uh, his conclusion was that uh, this looks like, he says, tentatively I identify this as a hoax. Um, and the reason is that the video originally was released on a website that uh, at least to some extent was connected with German film students. And so the idea is that this might have been a project of theirs. Now, I, I do know that there are people who, who conclude that this does not indicate that it's a hoax necessarily. There are people who, they've gone back and forth on this, but my point is that the evidence that has been out there in this video has been subject to discussion and debate for over a decade already before the whole rest of the world got to know about it. Um, it has come to my knowledge um, that the actual clip is much longer, significantly longer than what the public has been shown. So all of the analysis that's been done by all of the websites from Metabunk onward, they're working only off of a shortened, the shortened clip that the public has. And I know that there's a longer version of this clip. Same with the gimbal infrared video, which is this video number two that was really, in fact, it came out almost uh, simultaneously as the first one. And if you remember in the news articles and the stories that came out, this video <clears throat> um, right here was often shown along with Fravor's image. And even though this had nothing to do with Fravor's encounter, this is a separate incident. It is now known that this UFO occurred early in 2015, quite recent, off the U.S. East Coast, Florida, actually. Um, and that has been subject to a detailed analysis. This video is accompanied by some very interesting audio where the um, military personnel are talking in amazement about the, uh, the object, uh, unable to identify it. We do not know who released this video. I mean, people assume Elizondo somehow got it out, but I have not heard any statement from him explaining how it came out or whether he was responsible for it. Um, I have been told by a very, very um, serious, excellent researcher who has looked into this in great detail, actually a couple of them, that this video is genuine and it has been taken very seriously by the Navy and um, they consider it important. Now, what's interesting is that the analysis of it, though, that is available, and I guess the best one, in my view, is at metabunk.org. Very, very sophisticated analyses have been brought to bear on this video, and, um, and one of the members created a YouTube video of it and, and argued that this is most likely the hot exhaust of a jet. And, you know, you might think, oh, ridiculous, but it's, it's not a ridiculous argument. It's a six, seven minute YouTube video. You can go check it out. YouTube analysis, NY Times, UFO Explained, it's on YouTube. I don't know if that's true. Um, the only, if, that's, if that is the hot exhaust of a jet, this is a jet here, and that's the UFO, um, then it would mean that the audio it's, that accompanies it is a hoax. And uh, that's the only other explanation. Maybe it's a hoax. I've also learned um, from a, a very, very excellent um, source, an individual who knows the language exceedingly well of military personnel, that that audio uh, sounds 100% authentic. So if, if that's a hoax, it's a really, really superbly done hoax. So let's assume that this analysis is wrong, that this is not the hot exhaust of a jet, because again, here as with the Tic Tac video, there's a much longer version of that video that is known to exist from what we have been able to see. So again, why? 
And then the same uh, with the most recent, the third of the videos, the so-called Go Fast video, which again is really interesting and you hear on the audio uh, individuals uh, at one point laughing, it's a UFO. <laughs> what is it? It's moving very fast along the water. This white object, whatever the heck this thing is, it's zipping along. Now the problem with all of these clips, if you take them separately, independently, is um, you know, out of context, it's very difficult for, for me, probably for most of us, to know how to analyze them, again, independently of the context from which, from which they have appeared. Um, but what is, um, is clear to me is that there are these three videos, there are at least three more videos that I have been told are powerful Presumably, they'll be released. But, you know, there's a lot of questions about this. Why are only shortened versions of the videos been released? Um, you know, if, if To The Stars Academy is trying to get the public on board with the phenomenon and the information that they're getting from, from the inside, why are they only releasing short versions? of the real McCoy that presumably would be a much, give a much stronger case. And uh, the only good answer that I have received is that we, the public, are not the target audience of these videos. They're not out to persuade us. We don't really matter. There is a target audience, and that target audience um, partially resides in Washington, D.C. They're known as Congress, and they get funding for research and development projects. Taxpayers, money, that's the best gig in the world. You get the taxpayers to fund your research and development for your own profit center. The real key to all of this, I think, is Robert Bigelow. I think he is the center, or at least of this particular version of the of the puzzle, I think he's the key. Um, why? Well, I don't think there's many people in this world who probably have more knowledge or deeper knowledge of the whole UFO phenomenon than that man. He's been involved for a long time. I've never met him, I've never spoken to him, but uh, he's clearly deeply, deeply knowledgeable. He's got Bigelow Aerospace. He had an arrangement some years ago with MUFON to collect their reports. Many of you know about this. Um, my goodness, he funded uh, John Mack's uh, the Harvard Abduction Conference of the early 90s. He's been doing this for all along. He ran the National Institute of Discovery Science, NIDS, back in the 90s, which did a lot of work on black triangles and cattle mutilations and much more. So Bigelow is very, very involved, and if there's anyone who has the ability, the knowledge to use, to gain scientific and technological breakthroughs in propulsion or materials relating to UFO technology, transport, maybe getting a, a gig for a transport to Mars. He is one of the best candidates for such a contract. It'd be very lucrative indeed. And if your primary target is Congress, then you can show them, all you need to do is tweak their interests with a little bit of public information, get their eyebrows raised collectively a little bit, and then you start having private meetings. And uh, that is, to my understanding, going on. So uh, I don't know if Bigelow is having conversations, but I think it all comes back to him. So I think this particular disclosure effort strikes me increasingly as a, uh, an economic opportunity for a few individuals who are looking to monetize the uh, UFO phenomenon to the maximum extent possible. I think um, they're seeing maybe there's a little bit of a gravy train possibility here and they want to get on board. Um, can't explain why they were so sloppy about the Mylar balloon escapade, but that definitely uh, has not helped them. So, um, 
we're, we're not the target audience of this. That's really all that I'm, uh, all that I want to say about it at this time. And there's, you know, there's no intrepid journalism going on here in the mainstream media. The only intrepid journalism is going on by certain individuals who are sitting in this room right now who are actually investigating this in detail and really working the story. Um, I have a final word on this. In terms of disclosure, it's funny. I wrote a book that was called After Disclosure eight years ago. And, um, you know, I've wondered about this a lot ever since. Like, will there be a disclosure? It's George Norrie's favorite question to me on Coast to Coast. Richard, will there ever be disclosure? <laughs> and he loves it. It's funny because I, I felt that I got dragged into the whole disclosure debate um, because I'd written historical treatments of the UFO cover-up, so it's not unusual to think that. I would ask, have you know, thoughts on disclosure, the end of secrecy. And I believe in the end of secrecy. I strongly do. I believe that it's a good thing for us. Um, I just am doubtful that we'll ever get the, the kind of disclosure that we want. Uh, one reason is that the CIA is never going to walk away from the table of this. In other words, they've been invested in this subject for the lifetimes of every one of us sitting in this room, they're not just going to give up, throw up their hands and say, oh, well, the secret's out. Let's, let's tell the public everything. It's never going to happen. Nor the uh, military agencies involved that have detailed knowledge of this. They don't just walk away from their interests. Um, secondly, our establishment media is not partially controlled. It is completely controlled. They have no independence. You know, I did an interview about 10 years ago on... Uh, NBC morning show, I forget the name of it, it was in 08. I was sitting with Lynn Kitai, who studied the Phoenix Lights. So I was in a New York City studio, I'm not kidding you, and uh, live audience, there's like a hundred people out there, you know, those shows are. And it was a UFO thing, that's why they had me in. And he asks me, he's, and they didn't, they, he just kind of, uh, ambushed me with this question. He says, well, you know, it's true. They just discovered that the Phoenix Lights were these uh, warthog aircraft. Uh, haven't you heard? They've all been explained. And I'm like, what? So this is live national TV. And I'm like, you're not walking away with this one, buddy. And I, I said, well, no, that's specious. And I said, what's really interesting is that there's this long history of military encounters with UFOs that are absolutely inexplicable. And, no, and as I'm saying this, he actually got off his chair. He's off the chair right in front of me, off camera, and he's doing this. <laughs> as I'm trying to speak on the air, on NBC. No lie. So you want to talk about completely controlled, that's completely controlled. Um, yeah, it was amazing. So they're, they're never going to walk, I just thought of that. Uh, they're never going to walk away. It's a completely controlled system. Everything that comes out of there, none of that stuff is by accident. There's nothing extemporaneous uh, at all. Um, the establishment media will never cease to wage war against us, alternative media calling us fake news. It's amazing. They are the creators of false news. I talked earlier in this program about Syria, the one region of the world that just breaks my heart every single day when I see the lies that are perpetrated by this country, by this establishment media against that country. It just breaks my heart. And they are the creators of the true false news Paradigm, and they have been doing it for years and years and years and years. And since the 2016 election, have been able to turn it around somehow, miraculously, like a magician pulling a rabbit out of a hat, and they turn the fake news appellation around against us. How did that happen? But they have been trying to do it. And they're, they're kind of succeeding. They're kind of succeeding. 
if we let them. It's happening. They're shutting people down on YouTube. They're changing their search algorithms on Google. News is being uh, filtered out of Facebook. It's all happening, and it will only accelerate. And when people think, oh, it won't happen to the UFO field because UFOs are now becoming more mainstream, no, wrong. UFOs are becoming a little more mainstream to the extent that, yes, there's some acknowledgement that this phenomenon is impossible to keep contained forever. That's true. We are living in a radical revolutionary era, and this isn't the 1990s anymore. So things are changing. It's true. But that means it's all the more important for the establishment to be in complete control of the narrative. So if that narrative is going to be liberalized to some extent, they have to make sure that they are managing the parameters of it. And you mark my words, they will control as much as possible what is legitimate and what is fake, and they will seek to protect you from fake news. There's a law that just got passed in Malaysia, okay, other side of the world. Nevertheless, making fake news illegal, which means that if you're a citizen in that country, or a subject, however it works, if you were to disseminate what the government considers fake news, this is today, you go to prison or pay a lot of money in fines. Now, that's Malaysia. You think, well, it can't happen here. Of course it can happen here. There's an entire wave of political action against so-called fake news. In Britain, they've lost their minds over the Russians, if you haven't heard. I mean, they have collectively gone into total full-blown insanity, and they are now calling anything emanating out of Russia fake news, propaganda. We must combat it to protect the people. Do you think, for an instant, that this is not simply a convenient method for them to further consolidate their control over news? Of course, that's all that it is. So this is happening in the West. It's happening everywhere in the world. It's growing. Fake news is the new... Um, it's, you know, first they were talking about hate speech. Hate speech as a way to regulate the internet. You can't say certain things because they're hateful. Well, I would just say that the concept of hate speech itself is what is hateful. To determine that such and such a thing cannot be said because it's hateful, sorry, no sale here. All right? Uh, that is simply and only a way to limit freedom of discourse which is what we must have as a society if we're ever going to be healthy. We have to be able to talk openly about our problems. You can't just say that's not permissible to discuss. So that was hate speech. Now they're moving on to fake news. That's the new beachhead. And it won't be the last. UFOs will be included under the rubric of fake news if it isn't already. And we have to be observant of that. Uh, anything, and I mean anything... I don't feel extreme about too many things, but I feel extreme about this. I feel quite anything coming out of the establishment is part of the control system. It cannot be trusted. Don't trust it, any of those people. Any disclosure that comes out is none of this is going to be accidental. It will be carefully planned, meticulously planned, and thought out, not for your benefit, but for the benefit of other interests. And that's simply our world. I mean, I wish it weren't our world. I was uh, thinking, you know, about the movie The Matrix. It's almost 20 years old, that movie. I wish it were that easy. You take one red pill and you're done. You're like, oh yeah, I understand it all. It doesn't work that way, sadly. Like one red pill I could handle, that would be awesome. The walls melt one time, and then I realize, oh, wow, the world really sucks. Uh, I could handle that. That's better than what we have. What we have is uh, you have to keep taking red pills. The reason you do, because it's, it's layer upon layer of deception. It's layers of lies. It's, I, you know, I, I know I'm getting ready to wrap up here. Um, I just marvel at um, what I thought I knew 20 years ago, and I thought I was ahead of the game. And What's distressing to me is I'm now in my 50s, and I've been, I've been um, <clears throat> researching this subject for a, almost half my life time, and, um, and I've been able to do it. Like, I'm, I can do f this full-time, and I've been blessed with an excellent education. 
and, and with a desire of passion to get to the bottom of this. And I've been able more or less to devote full time to this. And you know what? It's still difficult for me to figure this out. And I just wonder, how can it be for most people who have to work actual jobs for a living, come home to your person, you have a beer, you watch some TV, and you just veg out? How do you fight the power in that situation? Uh, it's very difficult, right? So um, it's a little bit, it can get a little, a little distressing, a little depressing. The only, the, the good thing that we can take out of it is that uh, the world doesn't stand still. So things are constantly in motion. And the opportunities that we have now in terms of communicating with each other were not dreamed of uh, a generation ago. And there will be new opportunities that come up in the future that are tools for us, I assume. Uh, the other side of it is that those tools are going on to the side of the controllers, if you will, the elite. So uh, we're in the middle of a very dramatic era. There's this feeling of portentousness, you know? And I don't often have it, but I, I've been having it lately that something important is going on. And I don't know how this is all going to uh, roll out, but um, with our media going so... It's, it's just unabashedly now in the, the um, state of it's just the lies are breathtaking to me. They are absolutely, utterly breathtaking. Um, the worst thing, and I'm going to close here, is when I grew up um, learning about the evils of that country known as the Soviet Union and how they totally controlled their media, Pravda, remember, and how nonsensical it all was and how the state controlled it and how here in America we did it totally differently. We had a free society, a free press, and I was like, yeah, that's what we want. Um, I look now and it's like black has become white, white has become black. Oppos it's opposite day for the rest of all time. Our media has become their media. And I just wonder how the heck did that happen? But it doesn't have to be like that forever. As long as people like us care and speak up and are courageous and inspire others to being courageous, then, uh, then we have a good chance of righting at least some of the wrongs. Uh, I just want to mention I have two websites that are active. Richard Dolan Press is uh, the site where I have a lot of books, mine and that of many excellent authors that I have published over the years. I would encourage you to go take a look. I just started a new site here, uh, Richard Dolan Members. It's interesting. There's a lot of information on there, free stuff and uh, other exclusive stuff, and you can do take a look at that anytime you like. I will be available um, after this lecture at my table downstairs. I would encourage you, if you want to go chat with me, I will be there. My fiance, Tracy, and I will be happy to chat with you. And I'm going to thank you for your time today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. It was a privilege. <laughs>